to uh, present a, a role of endoscopic ultrasound in solid pancreatic lesions. And first of all, I have to thank uh, Professor Luciano Kacha for giving me this chance and the uh, Utopia company for uh, their great effort. Uh, actually, uh, I, I, will, I would like to uh, uh, present the main four questions and try to answer them. The first question is, do we need EOS for diagnosing solid pancreatic lesions? The second question, what are the pancreatic lesions that we face? What are the malignant pancreatic lesions that we face? and the different modalities used in diagnosing such lesions. Uh, of course, EOS, as you know, plays a critical role in evaluation of patients with known or suspected pancreatic mass, even lesions less than uh, one centimeter, maybe five millimeter even, and EOS has very high negative predictive value. However, we may have false uh, negative results in some conditions because in, uh, the, no technique is 100% perfect. And as I am going to show you that we may have in chronic pancreatitis, uh, underlying uh, chronic pancreatitis and hidden within malignant process. So uh, we call it the wolf hidden within uh, closes. Uh, uh, now I'm going to just to, to show you the importance of U.S. in diagnosing solid pancreatic lesions. Of course, we uh, uh, when we are going to do U.S., we start by the story, which is suspecting a lesion uh, on clinical basis in which we have unexplained uh, obstructive jaundice, for example, or uh, accidentally discovered a lesion in the pancreas by imaging for other uh, conditions, uh, or ERCP uh, discovering a, a, a common bile duct structure or pancreatic duct dilatation, or when we suspect that there is hormonal disturbance in a patient, especially uh, hypoglycemia or uh, the so-called watery diarrhea unexplained. So in such conditions, we may result to UAS. The second step is the detection. And by detection, that I detect the lesion itself. And by detecting the lesion, I have to keep in mind that we have certain sites that are difficult to be examined and is very important to uh, concentrate on them, uh, namely the ancinate process and the tail of the pancreas. Usually these sites could be uh, uh, very uh, difficult in examination, and we may miss lesion in such uh, lesions. Uh, secondly, the background of the pancreas itself. We may face a chronic pancreatitis in uh, many patients, and in such condition, we may miss a lesion. Uh, uh, we may miss the wolf inside this lesion. We may miss a, a neoplastic process in this background of chronic pancreatitis. So it's very important to uh, be uh, aware of such uh, conditions. Uh, certainly, characterization of the lesion. Of course, we have to know the site, and usually uh, uh, there are certain lesions that are, in, uh, uh, are present in certain areas. For example, insulinoma is very common to be in the tail rather than in the head region. The size of the lesion is very important because if we're discussing the size, it is important for staging and it is important for different lesions. For example, neuroendocrine tumors like insulinoma may be very small lesions, whereas the cancer pancreas uh, we may face from the start a, a quite large lesion. And also we have to see the lesion itself, whether it is having an effect on the uh, uh, pancreatic duct or the common bile, bile duct. For example, if, ne if we have a neuroendocrine tumor, as we're going to discuss uh, very soon, may not cause any uh, pancreatic duct dilatation or any common bile duct uh, stricturing. Whereas cancer pancreas uh, may be from the start causing uh, such changes. 
Also the echogenicity, if we are dealing with a hypotoic lesion, it is more with pancreatic adenocarcinoma. If you are dealing with isoechoic or slightly hyperechoic lesion, we may, uh, 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 we may be dealing with a uh, neuroendocrine tumor. Also the heterogeneity, the cystic changes, uh, this is very important because we may have a uh, solid pseudopapillary uh, uh, tumor which mimic uh, adenocarcinoma, but still it has some cystic components. And uh, at the end, we'll diagnose it uh, 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 apart from uh, being uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. It turns to be a solid pseudopapillary tumor. The vascularity also is very important because the pancreatic adenocarcinoma is hypovascular, whereas the neuroendocrine tumors and autoimmune pancreatitis, as I'm going to show you, uh, usually hypervascular. Also, the multiplicity of the tumor, if we have multiple tumors, this may point to uh, uh, secondary rather than primary malignancy in the pancreas. The fourth uh, step, uh, while we are during we are doing EOS for pancreatic lesions, we have to assess the size for staging as well, the adjacent structures that are invaded by the tumor, and there is if there is vascular invasion or not, and if there are lymph nodes in the vicinity of the tumor or not, or if there is metastasis or not. For example, here we have in the on the right side the upper slide showing a lesion here. And this lesion, as you see, uh, involving the uh, common bile duct and stricturing the common bile duct. And usually we have to target this area because this is the most important area that may involve malignant cells in, uh, while during uh, uh, doing uh, fine needle aspiration. And also we have to see the relation to the portal vein and the other vascular structures. Uh, in the second uh, uh, picture, we saw, he, we saw here that this is a mass encasing more than 50% of the portal vein. And in such case, we are saying that this is encasement rather than abutting, as we see in the third uh, picture, in which there is a, a loss of line of cleavage between the portal vein and the mass. Uh, so this is the importance and this is the beauty of uh, EOS in examining uh, the pancreas and pancreatic solid lesions. Uh, actually, we are dealing with uh, also benign lesions. Keep in mind that not always there are bad story. We may have happy story at the end. So we may get non-neoplastic process in which we may have, for example, focal fatty infiltration, uh, focal chronic pancreatitis, autoimmune pan uh, pancreatitis with focal lesion, uh, paradudinal pancreatitis, this is an, uh, 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 an evolving entity, and it's called also groove pancreatitis, peripancreatic TB, pancreatic splenosis may be present, mimicking a lesion in the pancreas at the tail, and it, turned to be, uh, it turns to be uh, just a splenul, uh, and ectopic uh, splenic tissue inside the uh, pancreas. Uh, the other condition, which looks to be benign, but it was uh, categorized as such entity relatively benign, which is a solid pseudopapillary neoplasm. And uh, I am going just to give some hint about uh, these lesions in the next slide. The solid pseudopapillary neoplasm was described by France and sometimes we call it Franz tumor. And exclusively, uh, I don't want to say exclusively, but mainly it is in females, middle-aged females, and usually it run a benign course, but still uh, it carry uh, malignant uh, transformation potentiality. And uh, it may be present in males also and in children, uh, and the, it tends to be malignant uh, in such conditions. So we have to uh, be very cautious when we find such lesion in uh, male patients, in adult male or in children. 
Uh, also, it carries poor prognosis when there is vascular invasion, when the size of the tumor is more than five centimeters, and uh, there is increased in the cytoplasmic ratio in the FNA uh, uh, fine needle aspiration, I mean. Uh, this is just a pathological picture of the lesion, gross pathology, and this is cytological appearance in which there is certain staining are used uh, in order to detect such lesions. So this is not our main domain in this lecture, but just I give a hint about it. Uh, now for the non-neoplastic lesions. Actually, from the non, for the non-neoplastic lesions, we may have on this left side the hyperechoic area uh, diagnosed by CT as hypodense, and the patient is sent for us, and we find such hyperechoic area, which turns to be which turns to be uh, fatty infiltration in the pancreas. So it's quite benign lesion, and also in chronic pancreatitis, we may have. Uh, some uh, localized areas of calcifications and nodularity, and also if there is a uh, peripancreatic fluid collection, it may have some sort of calcification, and it appears in uh, EUS as such a picture, as we see here by the pointer. And also autoimmune pancreatitis is very important entity to be kept in mind while we are dealing with solid pancreatic lesion. But usually it is in young patient or maybe also in old patient who may have autoimmune pancreatitis. And we may have extra pancreatic manifestations of autoimmunity like uh, such as uh, cell adenitis and thyroiditis, vasculitis, and so on and IBD, for example, also. So in such conditions, we may suspect on clinical basis the uh, presence of autoimmune pancreatitis. So please keep in mind, we may have good news in many patients uh, while we are waiting disaster. Uh, it is a, 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 a happy story. Uh, now, uh, just a few points as regards the uh, paradudinal pancreatitis or the so-called groove pancreatitis or cystic dystrophy of heterotopic pancreatitis in which we may have uh, ectopic pa pancreatic tissue inside the wall of the duodenum, and uh, this may initiate, initiate inflammatory process. And if there is some sort of stasis of the pancreatic uh, secretions at the uh, minor papilla in particular, as you see here in this picture, we have this groove in yellow uh, color. This is the groove in the, between the head of the pancreas and the duodenum, and we have here the minor papilla, and this is the duct of Santorini. And here uh, we may have an inflammatory process, severe inflammatory process that may initiate fibrosis up to structuring of the common bile duct with recurrent cholangitis up to causing uh, fibrosis in the duodenal wall uh, to the extent that we may have presentation of gastric outlet obstruction. And uh, uh, I think my colleague, Professor Hussein, has many cases. And also we have in our institute uh, uh, a case, uh, actually it was a female patient, middle-aged, presented by severe uh, gastric outlet obstruction, persistent vomiting up to shock and up to dehydration and uh, acute renal shutdown. And she is presented as well by recurrent attacks of uh, cholangitis and uh, common bile duct structure with several ERSP with stent uh, deployment. And as you see here, this is a very hazy area with uh, solid cystic components. We did if FNA from it, and we see some foamy cells, some depressed and some inflammatory cells. And the pathologist comment on this as having a groove pancreatitis. Uh, so uh, the point, the message is that we have to put in mind groove pancreatitis in differential diagnosis. We are facing a mass in the pancreas with presentation of gastric outlet obstruction. So in such conditions, we have to think. Actually, mostly it is 
derived in alcoholic patients, alcoholic male patients, but also in the literature when we have non-alcoholic patients, when we have females, not almost always male patients. Now, uh, the, this is slide depicting the differential diagnosis of malignant lesions, and we have to think of second risk. And the pancreas is one of the seeds of uh, secondary tumors, and uh, this uh, secondary tumors in 80% of patients, they are asymptomatic. This is very important. And uh, we may have uh, 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 renal cell carcinoma, even if the patient having such tumor dating 10 years before. So it's very important to have a good history while we are dealing with any patient. And this is a rule in medicine and especially in such conditions. We may have also a hor a, a hormonal sensitive tumors like the breast tumors, the ovarian tumors, the prostate tumors. So in such conditions, we, ha we, we, we have to do FNB in order to have a, a hormonal uh, test for the sensitivity by immune uh, staining. And this is, uh, the, this is very important to raise the issue of N FNA or FNB in such conditions. And uh, secondly, we may have the primary tumors, which is our uh, domain, actually, in any case with solid pancreatic tumors. And uh, in such conditions, we, uh, uh, we may deal with exocrine tumors or neuroendocrine tumors. And as we see here, that exocrine tumors represent 95% of cases and neuroendocrine tumors represent 5% of cases. We, other, we have other tumors and remind you that neuroendocrine tumors may be associated with multiple endocrine neoplasm and von Hippel-Lindus syndrome and von Recklinghausen disease in which we have neurofibromatosis and cafe au lait patches. So in such patients, if we have such finding cafe au lait patch neurofibromatosis with pancreatic solid tumor, we may think of uh, neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, this, is, this table just show you how we can differentiate simply between pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which is the commonest exocrine tumor, and neuroendocrine tumor. Usually obstructive jaundice is common with pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, especially if it's an, in the head region. If there is hormonal activity, usually it is with neuroendocrine tumor, not with pancreatic adeno, uh, ductal adenocarcinoma. Dilated common bile duct is usually common with uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. It's quite rare with neuroendocrine tumors. And we have a quite large tumor, uh, which, which is neuroendocrine tumor. And uh, although, uh, there is no dilated common bile duct, there is no obstructive jaundice. Also, dilated pancreatic duct is common uh, in pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. It's rare in neuroendocrine tumor. The vascularity, as we have mentioned, it is high poo in pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma and it's hypervascular in neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, this slide just showing you that about 12% of patients subjected to uh, weapon operations turn to have uh, other pathology, not uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinomas. About 6% maybe have histology metastasis, and the remaining 6% may have benign process. And so it's very important to raise the issue of biopsy and FNA and FNB, fine needle aspiration versus fine needle uh, biopsy. And all, as we have already mentioned, it's very important to have EOS for assessing the resectability, for the assessing, assessing the borderline resectability, and also for patients with poor surgical uh, uh, prognosis, they, are, they cannot have surgery, so we may have FNA to assess their conditions and to prove the pathology to have chemotherapy and uh, other modalities of treatment. What are different modalities used in diagnosis? Just this is the last uh, item. We, uh, as we uh, I have already mentioned, we pass in the stages of suspicion, detection, and consequently, we do endosonography. If we have elastography, this is fine. If we have contrast-enhanced 
EOS, this is fine, because elastography, as I'm going to show you, will detect the area of uh, hard uh, lesions, and this is the most suitable area for FNA or FNB. So elastography may be beneficial, although some um, authors they do not uh, prefer uh, they do not prefer uh, elastography. They said it's not that sensitive. But for me, I think that elastography is quite informative and quite helpful in many conditions. Uh, so uh, we are going to do by the end FNA solo. So, so far, I think FNA will uh, end the story and it is very important. And I think we have FNA and FNB, and this is a very uh, long issue that we will not discuss in our uh, lecture here, but we have to raise this issue in other conditions. Uh, there, of course, we may have contraindications for FNA or FNB. We, uh, also, the Japanese, for example, they don't like to have FNA from the body or uh, the tail for the fear of dissemination because we uh, introduce the needle through the peritoneal cavity, and this may result in dissemination. They prefer FNA from the head, not from the body or tail, and this is uh, a good idea, but some uh, other authors or some other uh, physicians and surgeons, they prefer to have FNA, whatever the lesion uh, is, whether it is in the body, in the tail, or in the head. This is just a slide showing you how elastography is beneficial. This is in lesion here on the right side. On the left side, this is bluish, and this uh, proves that this is a, a, gray, a, a malignant process is going on here. Here is chronic pancreatitis that's mimic uh, solid pancreatic lesions. When we do elastography, there is no bluish discoloration, and this may give us idea that this is not a malignant process. Now, also the contrast uh, we will show here, this is hypovascular, turns to be uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Uh, below here, it is hypervascular, either with neuroendocrine tumor, also with autoimmune pancreatitis, there is hypervascularity. And so these modalities may be helpful somehow uh, in uh, diagnosing such lesions. This slide just summarizes what I have already mentioned, and by the end, we may result to FNA or FNAB. And of course, the EOS is very important staging, assessing resectability and uh, the lymph nodes, the vascular invasion, and so on. This just slide showing you, this is a lesion in the pancreas. It turns to be a, a metastasis from cancer colon, uh, this slide showing the uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma with a frank picture of uh, malignancy in which we have hyperchromasia, increased uh, nucleocytoplasmic ratio, and loss of polarity, and all these uh, are criteria of malignancy. This short video showing the same picture I have already shown you, that this is lesion at the head region, and you see how it is separated from the uh, portal vein. And uh, this is, of course, a spiral mesenteric vein. This is a spiral mesenteric artery. And uh, you, uh, this is a heterogeneous lesion in which we have pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And this is the best site to have FNA in order to see the malignant process. This is, again, a short clip showing a, a, a rounded lesion, well circumscribed, tends to be more or less hyperechoic or either echoic with the remaining part of the pancreas in the case of insulinoma. And uh, you, you see how it is not distorting the anatomy of the pancreas. Usually the neuroendocrine tumor characterized by displacing the structures, not inflating, infiltrating or invading the structures. Uh, so in summary, EOS is quite sensitive and specific for detecting solid pancreatic lesions. EOS has pivotal role in 
detecting the nature of solid pancreatic lesions, EUS may be mandatory for proper staging and management of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. It may change the management if we have neuroendocrine tumor or metastasis. FNA is recommended in any solid pancreatic lesions if pancreas carcinoma is not sure diagnosis and even in borderline and resectable pancreatic ductal uh, adenocarcinoma. Migrating from uh, Egypt, this is our great Nile, and uh, thank you.